we've come to the last chapter of our dogmatics training material and we'll deal with the topic of eschatology and eschatology contains different sub aspects and the way we'll look at them is the term eschatology itself and then in the subsequent video we will look at the question what is apocalypticism and then we will look at the immortality of the soul and the resurrection then also at the parousia and that refers to the return of Christ and the judgment so this video will focus on eschatology and eschatology means the doctrine of the last things and it's derived from the Greek translation of the Old Testament especially, especially a passage that we find in Ecclesiasticus 7 verses 36 it says, what, Whatsoever thou takest in hand, remember the end, and thou shalt never do amiss. And that term, the end, is derived from the Greek words, ta eschata su. So that eschata, that's, it means the last. So the doctrine of the last things, that is eschatology. And as a term, it was introduced by Lutheran theologians in the 17th century. And it became a replacement for the Latin de novissimus, which also means the last things. So the term eschatology entered theology or the realm of Christian dogmatics to Lutheran theologians. Now, let's look at the elements of eschatology. Because eschatology, it concerns the individual person, it concerns all people as well it concerns the present what is happening in the present in terms of realized eschatology as we'll see later on and also eschatology in terms of things that will happen in the future that will impact the whole world everything creation people etc so let's first look at the first aspect of eschatology and that's individual eschatology and individual eschatology makes statements about the future of a human being after death. So what happens to the human person at the point of death? Does a soul, where does a soul go to? What happens to the soul? Is there a soul? Etc. Then there's universal eschatology. Universal eschatology makes statements about the future of the world after the end of history. So it looks what happens to all people. For example, this looks at maybe the return of Jesus and the resurrection or the last judgment. So there's individual eschatology, what happens to the person immediately after death, also leading up to the resurrection and the end of all things. And then there's universal eschatology that looks at all people. What happens to all people? at that final intervention or God's intervention into human history that will affect all people. Now there's also a further aspect and that is realized eschatology. And realized eschatology signifies that a turn in the ages has already occurred and that the time of salvation has already dawned. So in other words, realized eschatology refers to things that are properly future it's future salvation it's future resurrection it's future eternal life but somehow it's already occurring in the present it's already available in the present and you have for example the gospel of john is a very pronounced realized eschatology those who believe in jesus already have life etc also in the sense that the kingdom of god has already dawned with jesus so the kingdom of God that is properly future is already present. It's already here amongst us here and now. So that is realized eschatology. Then futurist eschatology. Futurist eschatology is a notion of a future time of salvation which is enduring and final. So that is the final intervention of God into world history. That's so 
we have already have our foot in the door in terms of realized eschatology, but we will only go across the threshold into the new creation, into eternal life, etc. Sometime in the future. And that's fu this is called futurist eschatology. Now, let's have a look at eschatolo eschatological ideas in the Old Testament. Now, the term eschatology can only be applied conditionally to the Old Testament. Eschatology in the Old Testament is not the way we would understand it today or, or for the bigger part of the Old Testament. Salvation and future events was understood in terms of salvation, live, uh, living free on the land, on the promised land. These are the events of salvation that will occur. And there will also be acts of future judgment. For example, the nations will come. Because of disobedience of God's people, the nations, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, whoever will come, and they will defeat the, the Israelite people through military battles. And that will be, a, in a sense, a, a day of judgment on, on, on God's people, as it was understood back then. It was only with the prophets where an extra dimension entered into Old Testament thought, where eschatology or future events, it's not just about local Israel and what happens on the land. It's, there was also a development in thought where events, future events, extended beyond Israel. And somehow the whole world will become incorporated into these future events. So in a sense it will transcend history. It will go beyond the history and localized Israel as it were. Now let's look at elements of individual eschatology in the Old Testament. Now individual eschatology does not play a big role in the Old Testament. For the most parts of the Old Testament, there's really no strong belief in life after death. And the, it was the understanding that when a person dies, the soul or the life force, whatever continued to exist, led a joyless existence. It's in, in the realm of the dead, Shehol, or in Greek, the Hades, it was a place without joy, it was lifeless, it was a shadowy form of existence. It was a place utterly removed from God and God's presence. It was only later on that the idea of life after death emerged. And specifically in relation to, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament itself, we find the reference to this in Daniel. In Daniel 12 verses 2. It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So here, yeah, idea developed where the souls were somehow asleep. Of course, there were also other writings at the time, not part of the Old Testament. It forms part of writings known as the pseudepigrapha, where there are many other writings that were produced that spoke of the souls that continued to exist in various realms and the beyond, etc. But in the Old Testament itself, there's hardly anything written about life after death. It was quite morbid. There was no hope for future eternal life. It's only really here in the book of Daniel where it became firmly established. And the book of Daniel was written in roughly 164 BC. So it was a very late development in Jewish thinking this idea of life after death and specifically resurrection as we have it here in Daniel. Now, of course, if you look at universal eschatology in the Old Testament, and yeah, the idea is that God's activity in history, etc., it, that it will transcend history, that it will transcend just life in historical Israel, that land, we, we find hints and suggestions of that, especially in the prophets. And yeah, we're speaking of people like Amos, Isaiah, Zechariah, etc. And they just don't speak of judgment that will come on the people for their disobedience. 
They speak of that, but also of the day of the Lord of hosts. This is an event that will not just incorporate or involve Israel, but the world. World history. World events will be affected by this. So, so it's not just within history when the day of judgment will take place, but it's also somehow it will transcend history. It will go above and beyond the present life or history that we experience here and now. For example, in Amos 5 verses 18, there the prophet says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Yeah, the prophet speaks of punishment that will come because for most Israelites, the day of judgment, it actually referred to God punishing the Gentiles. But yeah, the prophet Amos is saying, no, the punishment is also going to come to you. So beware, be wary of this day of the Lord that, that will come. Of course, part of this eschatological expectation or part of this eschatology of the Old Testament, it also involved a messianic ruler that will come. This ideal king that will come to rule Israel. And we find hints of that, for example, in Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7. It says there, for us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And also Zechariah 6 verses 12, where it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He has a reference to the Messiah. The branch that will come from the line of David, who will come to rule as Messianic king. Also in addition to this expectation of the Messiah coming in future, it's also the promise of the new covenant. A time of a new covenant will come. And we read this in Jeremiah 31 verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Of course, the early Christians understood that this new covenant came about with Jesus, especially his death and resurrection. In the words of institution that Jesus spoke, they said, this is my blood of the new covenant. And Isaiah also refers to a new heaven and a new earth. We read this in Isaiah 65 verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So we can understand that eschatology in the Old Testament developed over time. It first had a very narrow focus just with life on Israel, living on the land free. But with time, eschatology included events that, will, that transcends history, that just not affects Israel but all people. And it speaks here of the mess messianic ruler that will come, or the time of the new covenant, and also the new heaven and the new earth. So there's, there's more elements that were added to the eschatology of the Old Testament. Also, it's important to understand is that these eschatological statements in the Old Testament, there's no systematic or coherent doctrine. There are statements are made here, statements are made there. They cannot always be reconciled exactly with each other. But generally, it refers to a future time period when God will intervene. And this will include a new covenant or resurrection or judgment, whatever it may be. So ideas were quite ad hoc because they developed over time. So there was no systemized understanding of, in terms of exactly how future things will unfold or how God will intervene in the history of his people. Now, let's look at the eschatology or eschatological ideas in the New Testament. Yeah, the work and ministry of Jesus, of course, is of central significance because it's understand or understood that the future events promised in the Old Testament has become or was realized in the life and ministry of Jesus. The kingdom of God has already dawned with Jesus. The kingdom of God has, or the rule of God is already present also in the life of the church. So the kingdom of God has already dawned 
in Jesus, in the church. But of course, there's also this future expectation. Although there's this element of realized eschatology, some things have already been realized. There's already been a turn of the ages. Things have already started to change. We already have our one foot in the door, so to speak, in, into the future, into eternity. But not yet. This full salvation or judgment that will, God will bring has not yet been manifest. So there still is this future expectation of events that, that will occur. And now let's look at the elements of individual eschatology in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's a very strong link between individual eschatology and universal eschatology. Because it's based on the life of Jesus. It's based on his death his resurrection, and his future return. It's somehow Jesus in his death, resurrection, also the promised return. It's somehow the present and the future was somehow brought together. So individual eschatology, what will happen to the individual, and also universal eschatology, what will, in other words, what will happen in the future with everybody, it's blurry. They, 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 they interlinked. You cannot just strictly speak of the one and not somehow also touch on the other aspect. Now when it comes to individual eschatology, not much of it is also said in terms of what happens to souls after death. For example, we have the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. That's in Luke 16 verses 19 to 28. There it speaks of the condition of Lazarus in Abram's bosom and the rich man being a place of torment. Of course, the description there, you cannot take it literally in terms of that's exactly how the realm of the dead looks like and works. But based on this, we can come to the conclusion in terms of for our dogmatic theology is that individuality is preserved in different realms of the beyond. So there's individuality. That person continues in some other form to exist even after death. But also that there's different realms, different places, if you can call it like that, in the beyond. The New Testament also doesn't speak so much about the immortality of the soul. And it focuses more on the resurrection. And so exactly what's the state of the soul, like the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, it, it says that they continue to exist and there's some form of separation that takes place. But more than that, we cannot really know because the New Testament doesn't tell us. The New Testament focuses more on what will happen at the resurrection. And yeah, for example, we have a passage from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 to 44. Of course, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul sets out there the case for the resurrection. Because there were some in Corinth who did not believe in the resurrection. But Paul writes there, So also is the re resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So, yeah, Jesus is also the first of those who have resurrected from the dead. And his resurrection has actually inaugurated, has kick-started the general resurrection. That's why we're in this in-between place. This, this idea of realized eschatology, things are already present now, but also it will only culminate or it will be completed sometime in the future. Apostle Paul also addresses concerns of those people or Christians in Thessalonica because some have died there. So he was asked, now what, hap what will happen to these Christians? Because they've now missed out. They will not be here when Jesus returns. So what's going to happen to them? Of course, then Paul sets their mind at ease and he explains to them what will happen. And we find that in 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul writes there, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Paul does not explain the state of the dead here, but he says they will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
So that's elements of individual eschatology in the New Testament. Not much is said about the state of life after death, but much more is actually said about the resurrection, what will happen at the resurrection when Jesus returns. Now, let's look at elements of universal eschatology in the New Testament. So, as the Gospel says, Jesus came and He brought and He announced that the kingdom of God is with you. The kingdom of God proper will be established sometime in the future, when the will of God will reign supreme. But some of that is already here with us now. So again, this is, remember the strong interlink between individual eschatology and universal eschatology, also realized eschatology and futurist eschatology. In, in Christian dogmatics, it's very blurry because they speak to each other. They are standing in, in relationship to each other. So, of course, Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God with signs. Of course, it was also through His preaching, through His presence, through His miracle working. But also, because of the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead has been inaugurated. Like pa Apostle Paul says, Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The resurrection, in a sense, is already underway. It has started. So, this universal resurrection of all people, it's, it will happen in the future, but it's already in process. This turning of the ages has already begun. And also, this radical turn of the ages occurred through the appearance of Jesus. Because of his ministry, because of his death and resurrection. Of course, another element of universal eschatology, in addition to the resurrection, is also the last judgment. And of course, it's where Jesus will come to appear as judge, and where, where Jesus will appear as the righteous judge, and people will be divided into those according to the deeds that they have done. So these are elements of universal eschatology. It's the resurrection, the, re the resurrection of all the dead. Also the last judgment that will be performed on everybody. And then also another aspect of universalist eschatology is the new creation. There will be a new heaven, a new earth. This will affect everybody. And we find an image of this in the book of Revelation. There, chapter 21, verses 3 to 4. It says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Of course, the New Testament, like the Old Testament, does not have a consistent eschatology. Different ideas are said about exactly what will happen in the future and how it will happen. But generally, they agree that there will be a return of Christ, there will be a resurrection, there will be a judgment, and that there will be a new heaven, a new earth, or an age of salvation that, that is to come. Now let's look how eschatological thought developed in the course of church history. Of course, eschatological ideas were given by various church fathers. For example, the church father Augustine, he made important contributions to eschatology. And he, for example, said that the concept of the kingdom of God can no longer be applied to the people of the old time or, or, or the Jewish people but now it applies to the church. And he also argued that the thousand year kingdom of peace, for example, refers to the time span of the church. So there he had a different understanding to how we would understand the thousand year kingdom of peace. In the Middle Ages, if you look at eschatology in the Middle Ages, there the focus more shifted to individual eschatology. In other words, what happens to the person after he or she dies? And it's also at this time that the idea of an interim place of purification called purgatory developed in the Western Church, in other words, in the thought of the Roman Catholic Church.
Purgatory was a place where the soul could be purified. And when we come to the time of the Reformation, yeah, Protestant theologians rejected this idea that there's purgatory, that there's this in intermediate state of life after death where you are cleansed from, from from sins or whatever it might be, as, as the Catholic Church understood it then. For Martin Luther, for, he also believed that the person's eschatological salvation was already present in the latter's faith. In other words, the person who has his faith, his salvation is, is already present with him or her. Now, something developed also, because Protestants, they took many elements over of eschatology from the Roman Catholic roots also, of course, with their own objections and things they did not agree with. But a significant development took place in the eschatology in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah, a theological development today called liberal theology came into being. And it developed within Protestant theology. And, of course, it was influenced by the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, of course, it focused on human reason as a resource for knowledge, etc. So, it also affected how the people or theologians of the time thought about the world and, and various theological themes, etc. So, dealing intellectually, so to speak, with the idea of the future, some ideas or eschatological ideas were not so, did not sit so well with them. So they toned it down. And liberal theology had this position is that the kingdom of God will come through the progress of humanity, the moral progress of humanity. And this is a progress that will happen in time, with no intervention from God. It's that will something that will happen through the influence of the church and the gospel spreading to people, people becoming more moral, more spiritual, etc. And one of the key theologians of this time was Friedrich Daniel Ernst Schleiermacher. And he was at the forefront of liberal theology. And liberal theology interpreted eschatology differently. They would say the kingdom of God was not understood as a future coming kingdom, but was instead to come into being through the moral development of mankind. This meant that the greater the morality of mankind, the closer it was to the kingdom of God. So That's the kingdom of God. It was not God intervening into human history. It's not the resurrection. It's not the return of Christ as such. It's, it will become manifest by itself through the progress of human morality. But at the end of the 19th centuries, there was also this rediscovery of eschatology and theologians who come to dis disagreed with this view of liberal theology. And especially one theologian, if you look the eschatology in the view of Franz Overbeck, and he said that if you look at the original state of Christianity. It was very much eschatological in its orientation. They lived a life of imminent expectation. The Lord's at hand. The Lord can come any soon. So Franz Overbeck, he completely disagreed with this idea of liberal, or that liberal theology said that it, it will become a natural progression in the course of human history. The Bible tells us something different. Eschatology refers to God's intervention. And that's how the early church also understood it. Now let's look at the eschatology in the view of Albert Schweitzer. Now Albert Schweitzer, he's a very well-known figure and theologian from the past. And he was a medical doctor. He worked a lot in Africa. He was also a Nobel Prize winner. He was an organ expert. But also he was an excellent theologian. And he taught... New Testament studies at the University of Strasbourg. And he also published many important works also on like historical Jesus research that was done at the time. But Albert Schweitzer came with something that he called consistent eschatology. And he admitted that there was a strong 
eschatological expectation in the early church. The return of Jesus, the kingdom of God in its fullness is imminent. It will happen anytime soon. But then later generations, this expectation, there was disappointment. In other words, there was this... It did not come to fruition. And now he's Albert Schweitzer's of the opinion that this cannot be changed. This, this failure of this kingdom of God becoming manifest in its fullness, it cannot be changed. In Schweitzer's view, the eschatological imminent expectation of Jesus and the early church was not fulfilled. It cannot be updated either. This imminent expectation perished with the early Christian church. So that was the view of Albert Schweitzer. But that's not other theologians that don't necessarily agree. And later on, we find, for example, the theologian Jürgen Moltmann. He was born in 1926. And also because of the First World War and the Second World War, this idea of liberal theology, that humanity will automatically progress to a moral state that, in other words, where the kingdom of God will be realized in its fullness. That idea was shattered. This idea of liberal theology was proven to be false. If you look at the horrific events of the First and Second World War, where there's so much evil and death and destruction. So you cannot understand the realization of the kingdom of God as a cultural ethical development. So Jürgen Moltmann, he succeeded in reviving futurist eschatology. And he said that this was one of the central themes of Christian theology. And of course it's, and for this reason, an exclusively realized eschatology was not appropriate. Christian eschatology speaks of Jesus Christ and his future. So, Realized eschatology is important because the kingdom of God has dawned, but for Jürgen Moltmann, he revives futurist eschatology and says, no, this is about Jesus, also about Jesus and the future. And we cannot lose sight of that in the theology of the church. But he also said that living in view of this expectation of the future, it must also influence how we live in the present. For example, he writes in one of his books, it does not suffice to merely hope and wait for the coming rule of the risen Christ. This hope and expectation also defines our lives, actions, and sufferings in social history. So this Christian hope of future expectation, it must also influence our behavior now and how we live in the present in terms of solidarity or love and peace, etc., the condition of the world. But very importantly, Jürgen Moltmann revived futurist eschatology. Things will happen of importance, return of Christ, etc. But these things that will happen, it's not just about how we just live in the present, it will indefinitely carry on forever. Now let's look at the eschatological orientation of the apostolic movement and the new apostolic church. Now, if you look at the Catholic Apostolic Church and also the New Apostolic Church, from the very beginning it had a very strong eschatological orientation. In other words, the Catholic Apostolic Church, they viewed they were living at a critical time of history. There were signs of the end times, things that were happening here, especially based on the, the French Revolution, etc. Also, us as a New Apostolic Church, we also have this understanding that we live in the end time. And so our orientation is very eschatological. We look to the future. We preach about the return of Christ. Be ready for the return of Christ. Be prepared as the bride, etc. Now, of course, in the early times of the New Apostolic Church or before that, there was also the Apostle Schwartz. He also wrote quite a significant book which is called the book for our time and it consists of an interpretation of the book of revelation in other words Apostle Schwartz interpreted the events that the revelation 
says will happen, etc. Of course, this was a partial Schwarz's interpretation, but we can see here uh, this expectation of the future, this eschatological orientation was very pronounced. And we have this book also authored here by Paschal Schwartz at this time. Also today as a church, we have a very strong eschatological orientation. Also in, rela in relationship to the apostle ministry. For us, that the apostle ministry has been reestablished. It shows again that something significant is going on. This is, there's an eschatological dimension to it. Because the bride is being prepared by the apostle ministry. In, expecta in expectation of the return of Christ. So for us, eschatology and the apostle ministry goes very close together. It's, an es it's a manifestation of eschatological understanding of the time the Lord's preparing now. This is close to the end. That's why the apostle ministry has been reoccupied. Now, our sacraments also have a very strong eschatological orientation because they are, have, all three have eschatological significance. For example, holy baptism. That is to share in the death of Christ. That's to share in the new life that will begin to emerge. Because now this new life is beginning to develop. And so the death of the baptized refers to his or her death to sin. So the state of remoteness from God is lifted. It's now This fellowship with God is now again has been restored. Also Holy Communion. Holy Communion also puts us in touch with the future. Because Jesus, of course, he said in Luke 22 verse 18, for example, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And this is the words when Jesus instituted Holy Communion. So when we participate in Holy Communion, it's the closest and most intimate fellowship with Jesus we can experience in the present. But in a sense, it's also an eschatological meal because we look forward to its fulfillment in the wedding feast in heaven when full fellowship between Christ and His followers will take place. Also, Holy Sealing looks forward to the future because it's here where apostles seal that part of the church that's being prepared as the bride of Christ for the return of the Lord. So, of course, they're also being prepared for the marriage feast in heaven. It's to obtain childhood in God. It's where the rebirth has been completed. It's to become a firstling. It's, it's the Lord's work of redemption also. So it's a portion of the church that's being prepared by the apostle ministry for the return of Christ. So in that regard, our sacraments, also the activity of the apostle ministry, everything is eschatologically orientated. In other words, it's orientated to the future. But of course, there's also realized eschatology that those future blessings, we've, we have received the Holy Spirit now already. We have received forgiveness now, etc. So in a sense, we already have our one foot in the door when it comes to the future and the future events of eschatology. That we will end this video, and in the next video, we will look at apocalypticism.